a little while ago I did an all Asus Tough Gaming build using the Asus GT502 case, the Intel 13600 and then the RTX 3080. That was a really great system, the 3080 and also the 13600K went really well together. It was a little bit limiting though in terms of the highest spec that we could do, being that we had the LC240 which is the biggest cooler that Asus actually did in the Tough range. Fast forward a little bit of time, we now have the Asus Tough Gaming LC two 360 mil now using the 14700k as the intel 14th gen has just launched right around when i was planning this so it's perfect timing so i'm going to do a v2 and this one is going to be an absolute monster so as usual we'll get everything that we can onto the motherboard and then we can get that into the case motherboard wise we are using the asus tough gaming z790 pro wi-fi i have got a full video on this board on the channel if you want to check it out a little bit of a step up from the Z790 Plus that I've looked at. That was also the board I used in my previous GT502 build. So we are stepping it up again with this one. So I've got the board out. Now let's look at our memory. This is the Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB. I've got a 32 gigabyte kit, so two 16 gig sticks running at 5600 megahertz. Now this kit, along with some other parts, were sent out by Scan, one of the big UK retailers. They sell all sorts of components, also some pro audio video gear. If you're after anything electronic wise, then do check them out. I'll link them down below. Very nice matte black sticks for this one. I did use Trident Z last time, but these I think will look really nice. So we're gonna use slots two and four. Line up the notch and push those down so we get a nice click. One of my favorite kits around the Domplats. I really love how they look all lit up. So next let's look at our SSD. We are using a Solidime one terabyte P44 Pro in this case. This has got a 7,000 megabytes per second read and a 6,500 megabit per second write. Actually the drive I used in my Intel PC build off rig, um, really quick and looking forward to using it in this build as well. So just take the heatsink off, pop this in. We've got a nice little quick latch on the Asus board. So that's now installed really quick. Then we're just gonna remove the backing for the M.2 heatsink and then put the heatsink back on the top. Then last but not least, our CPU, as I mentioned, is the 14th gen 14700K. If you've got a bit of an older system and you're looking to upgrade entirely, then the 14700K is certainly one to go for. You may have seen some reviews of the 14600K that have been a bit hit and miss. There's been a little bit of an improvement, but this one now has four extra efficiency cores. So you have 20 cores and 28 threads over the 16 cores that you had on the previous generation. So let's now pop that down into the socket. Close the socket and then bring down the latch. The top will pop off, don't forget to keep that if you need to RMA your motherboard. So we've got our processor, memory, and also our storage all onto the motherboard. Now we can look at our AIO, get the mounting brackets on the motherboard for that, and we can get that all into the case. For our cooler, we're using the Asus Tough LC2360, the second generation in a 360mm, which I was really glad to see they've done a bigger version of. Full video on the channel if you want to check it out, I have done a full review of this cooler. I've literally just taken this out of the case that I reviewed it in, so it's still got all the fans, but they are in the configuration that I want. So it's going to be in a push configuration, so all the hot air will go out through the top of the radiator, and then we've got hot air that arises, so there's no need to fight it. And we can install it into a case like this. So we'll have the pump on the right hand side going down. All of the cables are also coming out the back so they can go directly down the motherboard tray to be nice and tidy. And we have got some adapters included in the box. So we've got one here for all the fans. You've got the three four pin PWMs onto one header. And then all the ARGB, we've got four connectors onto one. So we can control all of the lighting from the motherboard software. Here's the backplate we're going to use for our Intel board. It does support 1700, of course, and also 11.5x, 1200, the older sockets. Just need to move the little adapters depending on which one you're going to use. The further away it's for the wider sockets, so OJ1700, as it has got a slightly wider mount than the previous generations. Other bits we're going to need, we've got the nuts to go on once the actual top of the cooler is installed. And we've also got some standoffs and some little spaces. We're going to put one of these through, and then that will go through the motherboard into the backplate. So let's just take our motherboard, flip it over, and then put our back plate down. It does have some sticky tape if you want to actually install that, but I'm going to reuse this after, so I'm not going to use it for mine. But I just need to line that up and it will slot into place. Really easy, flip it back over. If you find it easy, you can take one of the little spaces, put that down onto the little part of the back plate and then put the little standoff down through and screw it in, but all up to you, personal preference. So I'm going to take the other three and then just continue to install these. And you're going to do them up finger tight. There's no need to wrench them down really hard. It's not going to do you any favors there. So just finger tight is good enough. Motherboard is now all ready to install along with the AIO. I'm going to get the case ready and also put the power supply in as well to make cable management a little bit easier. As I mentioned, the case is the Asus GT502. Used this previously in the last tough build. Really great dual chamber case, really easy to build in as well. As you can see, I've taken out the front glass that actually fell out in another take of actually redoing this part because microphone pack died. 
Jesus. Remove the front glass and also the back so we can access everything that we need to. So I'm going to lay this down and put my power supply in now, just so I can route the eight pin EPS connectors now. It just makes life a little bit easier, especially once you put your AO, then your motherboard in. If you've got big things like me, it can be really tricky to do after. So I'm going to do that now to make life a little bit easier. So the power supply is the Asus Tough Gaming 1000 Watt. I've done a full video on the channel if you want to check that out. So I have used this in the AP201 build as well. So it's got the same connectors already on there. We've got the SATA, so for all of our RGB and things like that. 24 pin, of course, the two 8 pin EPS connectors. And then last but not least, we have got the 600 watt, 12 watt high power cable. So we can go directly into our 4070 Ti. I also really love the braiding on these cables. One of my favorite cable designs I've seen come on the power supply straight out of the box. So let's get this installed. Just goes down like this. Tucks into this little bracket at the bottom as well. Then I'll get that installed with the screws that come included with the power supply. So now they're ready to be plugged in. Got a couple of other cables coming through from when I last used it. So now we can install the motherboard and the AO, which way around doesn't really make a difference. But I am going to quickly install some additional AF Tough fans from Asus. These are a three pack for around £40, so they're not too expensive. I'd ideally like to have four of these fans, but I've only got three. So I'm going to put two in the top right hand side for fresh air to be drawn in from the filtered back. And also one is a rear exhaust. So before we bring this in fully, I'm going to install the EPS connectors. I can clip this back together. The last board I used had a eight and then a four, so that's why that's detached. It seems to be very tight with the fan there, but that's now ready to be screwed in. Then we're going to be using these little 632 thread screws. I'm just going to quickly connect the USB-C header as it's right there, and also the USB-3. There we go. Nice clonks when they go in as well. So GT502 has got this little mount that you can take out, put all your AO and stuff on there, and then bring that all in in one unit. I'm just going to install it straight into the top loads. I've done it quite a bit, but obviously you can do it whichever way you fancy. This was already very tight to get in with the EPS connectors there, so I'm glad I did those to begin with. Otherwise, it would have been a really rough time after. So I've got that all lined up. Now I can just get this screwed in. I usually do two opposite corners because once they're screwed in, then you can then let go and it makes life a lot easier than trying to do it all one handed. So we just need to bring all the cables through. One thing I actually did with the last build I did of this was bring the cables along and then zip tie with some spare points along the top of the case here. Just kind of loop through um, to just bring them out of sight, which worked fairly well. I would like a couple of extra holes to kind of bring the cables through, but uh, maybe we can see that on a second generation. Now, it seems like it's taken a long time to get to this point, but I can now put some thermal paste on and get the top of our AIO onto the CPU. I'm just going to do a line with NTH2 from Noctua. You do get some included with the AIO box. I just like to use this because all my testing is then consistent. So we've got almost a little kind of snail trail there. So now we're going to just get our top and then it's going to go with the tubes at the bottom bring that down on the top like so then we're going to take these nuts and install these down i'm going to do them opposite i'm going to do the top left to begin with just so that it's basically just biting the thread i'm not going to go two nuts just yet hat nuts and then i'm going to go for the bottom right top right and then bottom left is an opposite pattern if you were to do like a wheel up on a car for example you do them opposites same for this so then you get nice even pressure applied down on the ihs so now we're applying a couple of turns onto each thread in that same pattern that I mentioned until it's screwed all the way down. And there we go, all installed. Now the one cable we're going to have to manage for this is for the RGB that just goes up through the top and then we'll try and tuck it down along the dim slot there. We'll worry about that more at the end when we're just tidying things up. So I brought the 24 pin through for the motherboard. Let's just get that connected up. There we go. We can play with the cables on that one later as well. I've also got the 12 watt high power cable for our graphics card ready. And then we've got the front panel. Now on this board, it's going to be pins three and four on the top for power and then three and four below for reset. So I think we're now ready to get our graphics card in. Then it's a bit of cable management and hopefully we can see it all boot. For this one, we're using the Asus Tough Gaming 4070 Ti. This is the 12 gigabytes OC edition. Again, big thank you to Scan for sending this out. We've used this in a couple of builds so far and it's been a really, really great card. It is one of the more affordable 70 Ti's as well. Um, as far as those go. A little bit of a last minute idea. I've got this Fantex vertical mount, but it can go at a slightly like 45 degrees, which I think would look really nice in this system. So I might use this, I might not. Might do a bit of a play around with and without and see what I like better. Um, but that's an option you might see at the end of the video. Um, TBD on that one, but let's just get it installed normally for the time being. We've got a little panel to open on the back that will allow us access 
to all of the expansion slots. We're going to take out two and three for this one. Now the latch on this board is one of the quick release ones from Asus. Really, really good to have if you're using any cards for benchmarking and things. You're constantly swapping things out. Really nice to have. I'm going to take the display port and then also the little protective cover off the PCI slot. And this can now go down, line up with our slot and press till we get a nice click. There we go. Then it's just a case of putting our screws back in on the left hand side. Need to get the high power cable clipped in like that. So that is our system all put together. I've obviously got a lot of cable management to do to make all the lights RGB as well, especially. I might have to use the hub that comes included with the tough fans, we'll see. Um, but I'm going to get that all connected and hopefully I'll see you back in a minute where this thing will power on. So we're now ready to see if it posts. It's taken a little bit of time to get to this point. It's the joy of having loads of RGB. Um, but I've managed to use all of the headers on this board. Thankfully, we have got three on the Z790 Tough Pro board. So let's see if we can get a signal. Okay. We've got, I think, all of the RGB. That's a good start. A bit past the leaf for the other ones. I'm not quite sure why that is, but that's something we can obviously change in the software. What have we got rattling? One of the EPS connectors catching one of the fans well, it's hopefully now into the bios don't worry about the vertical mount and all that kind of stuff i was playing around with different configurations not entirely sure if i want to keep it like that uh, i might see if we can find some kind of mount to put in it hopefully come on here we go f1 new cpu installed that is correct so now we should be able to see our bios menu so let's just check everything's here so corsair Two sticks, 16 gig, 4800. Obviously, we're going to enable XMP on the left, so that should go up to 5600. There we go, 1.25 volts, cast density 36. We've got the 4700K, we've got our memory, Solidime is recognized there as well, so that's all good. Let's do F10 and enter. So the system is now all working. I've got to install the drivers, windows, game benchmarks and stuff where we can do that. But let's take a little bit of a closer look with some B-roll. Now it's all built. So let's get into our games. First of all, we're doing Starfield 1440p high preset. Also quickly so you know, I am using OBS to record this, so the results you'll get in person will be a little bit higher because OBS does use some of the system resources to actually record. 65 to 75, I think, is what I would generally find during this scene. Uh, like I said before, Starfield is a really difficult game to run, but we will try the frame generation out and see if that gives any improvement. Let's actually just swap halfway through. Not too sure why DLSS is actually greyed out at the moment, but we shall see what kind of improvement we get. Well, up to 106, 105. It's like a good 30% improvement. 120, that's better. Come on, seeing around 115 frames. That's what we'd like to see. So almost, what, 60, 70% again on what we were getting before. That's really good. I'm so glad they've put some kind of frame generation in this game. It's needed it so badly. This is actually really nice and buttery smooth now over the horrible, like, skippy mess that we've played before. So really nice to see that. So around 115 to 120 frames using frame generation on the 4070 Ti. So for Dirt 5, we're going for, again, 1440p high preset, and then we use the built-in benchmark so it's nice and consistent. Typically, we get around 130 to 140 frames using a 7800 XT 4070. So, of course, the 70 Ti is a little step above that. So let's see what kind of results we get. So a whopping 171.9 average there on high for Dirt 5. We did see a 145 as the low 1%. So if you're going to go for 144 hertz high refresh monitor, you're at least going to hit that. So that's always a good thing to know. Minimum, I wouldn't worry about that. We always get that dip every time I run it. Not really sure why. So if anyone does know, please let me know. But that's a very good result for Dirt 5. So now let's move on to our next game. On to Crisis Remastered, we've got a high with ray tracing off to begin with. 
We'll try it with and without. We're going to turn motion blur off though because it's trash. And then jump into our game. I like to give a normal high setting and then a ray trace setting for anyone that does like to use it. I know not everyone's a fan of ray tracing, so it's nice to give you both results. So into 1440p high without the ray tracing. I'm just going to jump straight into the action here. Try and get as well as we can in this. Oh, 190, 180 frames though. We're doing very well so far. I've really hit and miss days with this game. Sometimes I suck, sometimes I can clear everyone out quite well. That's a realistic barrel, not a video game barrel. Oh, wiped out already. Around 170 to 200 frames though, that's certainly doing very well. Let's now just bang on ray tracing and see what difference we're gonna get. We'll go over high again. So it will take a little bit of a dip, around 50 frames or so loss, but obviously you're paying for that quality difference. Ooh. 140 frames, that's better. Another gun. Oh, 130. So around 120 to 150 frames with ray tracing on high. Fairly good results. Of course, we are using the TI model, so we will expect some better frames. So on to Cyberpunk. First of all, testing 1440p high without ray tracing, because I know a lot of people don't like to use it because it just taxes your system so much. We are sat around 150 frames to 156, 158. You might see 160 if you're lucky. Now let's just turn on ray tracing for those that are wondering about how that will affect it. I use the top three settings for anyone that's wondering. We are now at around 110 frames, so you do pay just over 25% of your frame tax once you put it on ray tracing. So I see why a lot of people don't like to run it all the time. Does make the game look pretty though. Now let's quickly just turn on DLSS and see what improvement that gives to us. I'm going to use a balance preset for this. 0.8 is my preferred sharpness as well. Now up to around 165, almost saw 170 there. But that's great considering we're going now above the frame rate we saw to begin with, and that was without ray tracing. So we've now got the best of both worlds. We've Hannah Montana it up. So very impressive results there. Okay, so on to Apex Legends. This is one game that has got a much lower graphical fidelity than the other one, so I don't expect it to be difficult to run at all. Currently sat around 260 frames, so of course you can obviously go higher settings if you'd rather. So I'm going to do my usual little thing that I do. 173, a little bit of a drop there. But straight and back to 255, so really nothing to worry about. I would say though you can obviously turn your settings up and still retain the high refresh rate if you want to go for a 144 hertz monitor, even 165 to be fair, and uh, still get a really nice gameplay and quality. So Apex Legends on the 4070 Ti, yeah, piece of cake. Last but not least, onto Far Cry 6. I have got everything set to high. I always run the same settings, and then we have got motion blur off. This one's got a built-in benchmark again, so it's nice and consistent. So let's see what we're going to get from this. It's a little bit lower than I expected with 141 as an average. I have seen that little dip kind of been ironed out by the recent updates of the game though, so that's always a good thing to see. But I would expect to see that result with a card like the 7800 XT, for example. So a little bit lower, but as we know, some games do perform better on cards than others. Okay, so we now have the full build all done. Benchmarks is all complete and everything. Seems like it's taken me a literal week to do this build. It's taken a long time. But it is complete. This build is exactly what I wanted the original tough one to be. A 360 radiator, higher end graphics card and SKU CPU as well. And it's turned out bang on exactly what I wanted. Did take me ages to decide about the vertical mounts. I tried loads of different ones. That's what dragged the, uh, the actual progress of this video out. Me deciding what I'd thought liked, looked the best in the front. I've settled on the Fantex one. I think that does look nice at an angle. Certainly very different from what I've seen with other tough builds as well. So results. For temperatures and things, first of all, we'll go for the CPU. We had a Hive 96, it is a higher end TDP processor, and it's 14th gen, which we've seen all the running hot. Delta, though, with a 19.4 ambient room, was 76.6. Did do very well with the cooling, especially as it's more an affordable cooler, especially the Asus have got the Ryogen, for example, that goes up to over £300. This is 150 which I think is very reasonable for the performance. One thing I did notice though, is there was a lot of volts going through that 14700K. So if you're gonna run this CPU, even the 14900K, then certainly undervolt it. Loads of tutorials on YouTube on how to do that, but that will certainly bring those temperatures down. 
as 96 is a little bit high but then again we are using an artificial benchmark to get those results so real world use might be a little bit lower then of course the gpu the 4070 ti tough edition i've used this in a couple of builds before a little bit of a warmer result for this one we saw 87.2 uh, with the delta of the room it was a 66.1 but bear in mind i am angling that card which is quite restrictive for airflow so if you were to put it in the normal configuration even put some fans in the bottom temperature is going to be a lot lower i've seen a lot lower with this card as well which is in a very particular position that it's just not getting quite as much air as it normally would i also ran some other benchmarks that are free to download so you can download those yourself compare what your system is currently running to what i've got here if you're wondering about kind of an upgrade pass for example i have done 3d mark time spy uh, Geekbench, Blender, and then also Cinebench. Cinebench was by far the result that stood out for me with a 33,500. For a little bit of context, the 14600K build I did a couple of weeks ago, the all white one, that scored 23,000, so 10,000 points higher just for one stack up the skew, and one skew up the stack, I should say. But really great CPU. I think it's certainly the one to go for if you're going to go 14th gen. The 14.6 and the 14.900K had a little bit of a boost, like I said, but those extra four efficiency cores in the 14.700 certainly do a great benefit over the 13.700. I think I'm going to leave it there. Like I said, it feels like I've been doing this for about a week, this video, so I'm going to get it all finished and wrapped so we can get on to the next one. But I will put all the product links in the description box if you want to pick one up. Of course, a big thank you to Scan, Asus, Intel, and also Solidine for all the products that they've sent out for the video. Any more questions, leave them down in the box below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.